to the show where we share the stories of the many who intersect with our healthcare system but are rarely heard from. My name is Kevin Poe, founder and editor of Kevin MD. Rate and review the show at kevinmd.com slash rate. Subscribe at kevinmd.com slash follow. Today, we welcome back on the show, Paul Pender. He's an ophthalmologist, and his book is titled Rebuilding Trust in Healthcare, A Doctor's Prescription for a Post-Pandemic America. His most recent Kevin MD article is titled Open Angle Glaucoma to Screen or Not to Screen. Paul, welcome back to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Kevin. Now, you've been on multiple times, and for those interested in hearing more about Paul and his story, just go to kevinmd.com slash podcast to look up old episodes. But I want to get straight into your most recent article about open-angle glaucoma, to screen or not to screen. But before talking about that, for those non-clinicians listening to this, just talk a little bit about what open-angle glaucoma is. Okay, well, we know that open-angle glaucoma is the cause of blindness in the world population, only second to cataract. And so in this country, it is a very important source for visual disability. And so I wrote the article because the condition which causes damage to the optic nerve and vision is due to a slow buildup of pressure inside the eye. There's fluid being made inside the eye continuously, and it has to find a way to, to sort of escape. And it doesn't leave in the way of tears, but it's in, absorbed internally. So I was prompted to write the article because the U.S. Preventive Health Service issued a, a statement that was essentially the same as it was in 2013, which said that there's really no benefit to screening in the general population for primary care. And I thought, well, what about the populations at risk, such as Blacks, Hispanics, those who have a genetic or a familial inheritance pattern for glaucoma, why shouldn't they be screened? So the article went into some detail about why I think we should screen for open-angle glaucoma in high-risk populations. When you were practicing ophthalmology, how do people normally present to you with the signs and symptoms of open-angle glaucoma? They may not present at all, and that's the point. They may come in for a routine eye exam, you measure their eye pressure, you look at their optic nerve, you, you suspect that there could be a problem, you know, you start digging in more into the history. Oh yeah, they had a, a father, a uncle, someone else who's had damage to their vision that was only picked up late in the game. And so oftentimes a patient will come in who just is there, they're over 40, they're coming in for a regular eye exam. Maybe they started needing reading glasses mm -hmm. and buying them over the counter and finding that somehow it's just not quite right. Maybe I should get my eyes checked. And so it goes beyond just a simple measure of intraocular pressure. There are other ways of determining whether the optic nerve is relatively healthy comparatively. And so these other tests that we find are very helpful in diagnosing glaucoma may be considered either excessive for the purposes of general screening, but I still feel like those diabetics, those people who have a racial preference for this particular disease should be screened. And how does one normally screen for open angle glaucoma? Okay, I, I think you begin by getting a good history and doing your full eye exam. You also will look at things like the intraocular pressure. You look at the, the essential area where that fluid has to leave the eye in what we call the anterior chamber angle. Uh, you also, We'll look to see if there are any other clues as to why the pressure may be high, such as flaking a material off the lens capsule, which is something that we see fairly often in certain populations. And that tends to create sludge in the drainage system of the eye. So, so anyone who has other clinical findings, including things like iris transillumination, by shining a light with a slit lamp, through the pupil and getting some background reflection through the iris, you can see where pigment has been dispersed. And so some of those patients who are who only come in for their eye exam because they have high nearsightedness, you find that they have pigment dispersion and that might be a precursor to glaucoma. So once you suspect it, you do the, the, the kind of testing that's necessary, including visual fields, mm -hmm. the peripheral vision, you look at the ganglion cell nerve thickness. There are 
pretty sophisticated test that can be used in order to really confirm the diagnosis. But you have to start with the assumption that a lot of the patients don't have any symptoms at all. When one picks up early signs and symptoms of open algal glaucoma, what's normally the next step that you would do to prevent okay. its progression? I think what you do is you, you want to repeat some of your tests to see whether the eye pressure was just a periodic, you know, abnormal value or whether this is consistent. You bring the patient back to do some of these additional tests that may be necessary. <clears throat> but if you confirm the diagnosis, the patient often has a couple of choices. One is to get started on ocular medication, eye drops that will help reduce the intraocular pressure. Oftentimes the most popular drug is, is a generic that's used just once a day. Mm -hmm. But there's also evidence that a special type of laser treatment into, into the tissues that actually help improve the drainage of that fluid can also be equally effective as medication. One of the other points that I think should be raised by this article that was posted in JAMA Network is that the task force recognized that, yes, this is a real problem, but they couldn't, by their charge, discuss the costs of screening. They were just talking about what is the evidence of harms versus benefit. And I think that, yes, if you start getting into some of these tests, that will become an expense that often is covered by insurance and not just through vision care plans for glasses. But the other part that should be brought up is in subsequent articles that JAMA Network published, they said that Blacks and Hispanics are less likely to be able to afford their medications. And so there's a problem with adherence to therapy, even if you do diagnose it. So I think what we're facing really is that if you don't diagnose it and you wait until signs and symptoms appear, as the task force had, has basically said, that damage is already done. Mm -hmm. And so I think that it really behooves those of us who see a, a wide variety of patients of various races and what have you, just to just have your index of suspicion that these are people that probably should be evaluated by ophthalmologists to see if, if because they're at higher risk to see if they have glaucoma. Now, if open angle glaucoma is picked up too late in the game, talk about some of the permanent repercussions that may have on patients. Well, I, I raised the classic example of Kirby Puckett, the former all-star outfielder who had to give up his professional career early because he couldn't track fly balls. So his peripheral vision was compromised by his glaucoma and he didn't know he had it until late in the game. So to your question about what sorts of things can happen to the vision, it may not be the central acuity for reading or for looking and doing fine tasks early on, but the peripheral vision, that, that what we rely upon for navigating spaces and avoiding <laughs> you know, pillars and posts and to drive safely, peripheral vision is really necessary. And so the impact of damage from glaucoma can be devastating to someone's lifestyle. So in the primary care setting, how does one screen for glaucoma? I know that whenever I go to an optometrist, they always do that puff of smoke into the eye to measure intraocular pressures. So is this something that we should refer to optometrists? Is this something that could be done in a primary care setting? Well, I think what, what happens if, if I can actually refer to my notes, because the task force says the American Academy of Ophthalmology recommends that decisions regarding when to initiate eye evaluations and the frequency of periodic exams be based on the risks, but does not provide specific guidance, end quote. However, just going to the American Academy of Ophthalmology website, the list of risk factors are right there. You know, being over 40, having family members with glaucoma, having African, Hispanic, or Asian heritage, having a history of high eye pressure, having an ocular injury, maybe not just superficial foreign bodies, but things like, you know, baseball injury to the eye or soccer ball injury, being extremely farsighted or nearsighted. These are patients who wear thick glasses that also have some compromise to their anatomy. Mm -hmm. And, and then just diabetes, high blood pressure, and those with poor circulation, certainly in the primary care setting, you see a lot of people with those conditions, diabetes, high blood pressure, and, and poor blood circulation, and they should probably be evaluated. Add on top of that, if they're from 
black or Hispanic extraction, you're going to have higher risk populations that I feel should be screened. Now, if you were writing the screening guidelines for open angle glaucoma, what exactly would you recommend? Okay. I think that after taking a, a full history like you do for all of your primary care patients, and there's any evidence that I mentioned before about high risk factors, then, then I think that patient should be evaluated. Mm -hmm. Optometrists can certainly check intraocular pressure and they may have the sophisticated equipment to be able to look at, at that as a possible diagnosis. I think ophthalmologists in general have the equipment, the education, the training to be able to make the call. And, and so I, I think that in a primary care setting, it's first you have to suspect that this patient might be at higher risk and therefore make that referral. We don't expect primary care doctors to measure intraocular pressure. That's not in their purview. But we do believe that once, once the patient falls into one of these higher risk categories that they should be referred. We're talking to Paul Pender, regular guest on Kevin MD. He's an ophthalmologist and his book is titled Rebuilding Trust in Healthcare, A Doctor's Prescription for a Post-Pandemic America. His latest Kevin MD article we're talking about today in the show is open angle glaucoma to screen or not to screen. Paul, what are some of your take home messages that you want to leave with the Kevin MD audience? I think the first thing is when you start considering the overall policy, this decision that was made by the task force was really made by academicians. And, and there wasn't a single ophthalmologist on the panel. And so I, I think that there's maybe some myopia on the, on the, on the part of the task force. And, and finally, I think that when you consider screenings for other medical conditions like colon cancer, you know, what I was reading is the, the statistics are 40% of those screenings without previous symptoms may show precancerous polyps but only 0.4% find actual evidence of cancer of the colon. So you say, is, is screening for open angle glaucoma worth it? And I think it is, especially in the high risk populations. And what you're saying is that by the time signs and symptoms develop, there's already enough damage to affect someone's lifestyle, their ability to, to function, to navigate properly, to drive. And so, you know, to me, anyone who might have these predispositions by either by race or by their medical conditions ought to be evaluated. Paul, thank you so much again for sharing your time and insight. Thanks again for coming back on the show. Thanks a lot for having me on.